Thomas. President Muhammadu Buhari's bland visit to Imo State causes quite the stare. IPOB orders sit-at-home order and dares the president to come, while Ohanez Indigo, youth, uh, Ohanez Indigo welcomes him, will be joined by the Deputy President General of the Igbo Social Cultural Group. Also coming on The Breakfast this morning is the Lagos State Commissioner for Fiscal Planning and Urban Development, who will be talking about the government's plan for residents. Don't forget Off the Press, where we give you in-depth knowledge on the headlines of uh, the day's newspapers. Good morning and thanks for joining us here on The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. Middle of the week, Wednesday morning here, and uh, we hope that you have a very, very interesting time with us. I am Osao Gi Ogbon. And I am Annette Felix. Glad to have you join us on The Breakfast. Good morning, Osao Gi. Good morning. Our top trending stories today. Now, on Saturday, Imo State Governor Hupu Zodima had announced that President Muhammad Buhari will be visiting his state on Thursday today to commission some significant projects. And um, he had returned from a trip to Abuja where he said he and the president had discussed some very key political issues. So the top trending story here is the reaction of the indigenous people of Biafra to that announcement of the president's coming. Now they have gone ahead to declare that the president is not welcome in Igbo land. He is not welcome in Imo state and what they've called Biafra land. So it's just an opposition basically to the president's visit um, into Igbo land. We know that the IPOB ghost Mondays are still on, even though it has been suspended and they've gone ahead to declare another citizen order. So it seems like a confused situation there in the southeast where um, we're seeing different um, announcements there regarding um, if people are sitting at home or not to force the hand of the government to release Namdikanu. But here's what's you know here's what the situation is. They have dared the president to step foot in Imo State. The president's um, visit to Imo State is definitely part of his schedule of activities for today. So I guess we'll just be um, waiting to see the showdown with the president actually go ahead to Imo State to commission this project with his security and all of that. Or right. does the IPOB have plans to blockade the airport? So what exactly do they have up their sleeves to give them such authority? Because when they spoke, it seemed like they had the power to go ahead and back their word. But it's just left for us to see what eventually happens in the next few hours in Imo State. Well, I'll tell you for free, the IPOB can't do anything. Um, this is really just, you know, them um, in local parlance making mouth. Um, <laughs> you know, I'll tell you that for free um, because it's not the first time the president has visited the Southeast since uh, they've been agitating. Um, they always will put out segments like this every now and then. Um, so two things that I will mention. First of all, you know, I personally don't, you know, subscribe to the... Um, idea of presidents moving around different states to commission projects. Um, I feel, you know, it's, it's, it's still politics. Mm -hmm. It's really just politics. Um, because I feel like if, if you're a governor and you are working for your people, you're doing the things that are meant to be done, you're you know, investing in infrastructure, in healthcare, in education, some of all of that, go ahead and do it in silence. You don't necessarily need to make such a loud noise every time that you build um, a poultry or you build um, a bridge or you build uh, you know, a, you know, a, a big building that they call uh, state of the art you know, here in Nigeria because they, 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 they will quickly rush to call anything that is built state of the art. Um, you know, model infrastructure and some of all of that. You don't necessarily need to be inviting the president every time that you build something. And this really just says that, you know, it's obvious that you're not building, you know, infrastructure every, you know, as often as you should because, you know, this is, you know, one time, you know, the next time the president will be invited to commission anything, maybe, you know, it will never happen, you know, through Hope Zodima's uh, tenure. But that's, that's for him. Um, so I personally don't subscribe to it. You can, you can work in silence. Nobody needs to come and help you commission anything um, every time that you build, you know, some level of infrastructure. Um, that's on the side. With the IPOB's views, um, yesterday we, we had a conversation, you know, and one of the things that was established was trying to figure out who exactly controls 
the political space and the narrative in the southeast? Is it the governors? Is it Ohanes Ndibo? Or is it Ohanes Ndibo worldwide? Because they're, these are two different bodies, the Ohanes Ndibo and the Ohanes Ndibo worldwide. They're two different bodies entirely. Um, is it the traditional uh, leaders? Is it IPOB themselves? Or is it the ESN? Who do the people really listen to when they say, don't come out of your, your homes on Mondays, um, you know, side by side with when the government says, come out and do whatever you want to do. You're free to, you know, go about your lawful businesses. Who do the people listen to? And it's going to be interesting to see how tomorrow plays out. So it's actually tomorrow, Thursday. It's going to be interesting to see how, <laughs> how it plays out tomorrow. If you know, they will be able to enforce that, which I don't think they can. They're, they're really just enjoying, I've said it multiple times, the attention. that the IPOB is enjoying the attention <laughs> and the euphoria of power that, they see, that they've seen that they have in the Southeast to, to tell people to stay at home. And it's not because people actually respect them or, mm -hmm. you know, everybody is really interested in their cause anymore. It is mostly because of that element of fear that, you know, we pointed out yesterday that people would just rather stay out of trouble and, you know, not get themselves involved in any violence mm -hmm. um, and, you know, leave that Monday. Um, but it's hurtful to see that one of the things we mentioned yesterday, that when the IPOB puts out a statement like that, the government who controls the power and security agencies in the whole of the Southeast cannot put out a counter statement and get people to actually do what the government says. So if the federal government, if the state government, the Southeastern governors say um, there's nothing like sit at home on Monday, everybody mm -hmm. should come out, businesses should be open, nobody's going to listen to them, which is painful. And um, the people who control security agencies, the, the federal government, mm -hmm. cannot also assure the people of the Southeast of their own safety and security when, they, when you know, these things happen. So they're really just sitting back and then, you know, watching the Southeast shut down every Monday, which makes absolutely no See, sense. See, you, you, you know, this is something I mentioned yesterday. I think getting people to fall in line regarding certain things, getting you know, people of the Southeast to go ahead and live their lives, right? Getting people in the Southeast to disregard that sit at home order would actually take more than press releases, even though, of course, that's one of the ways the people, the government can communicate with the people, you know, let's see your stance in this using press releases. But I'm saying it's going to take much more than press releases. We know that the Ohanes Ndibo worldwide, released a press statement yesterday. This was signed by um, Deputy President General Ohane Zingbo, Ndibo, Mr. Dim Uchi Okuku, who will be having on the breakfast later on today, released a press statement asking Ibo, um, all Igbos and residents in the Southeast to disregard any sit-at-home order, go about their lawful activities, and all of that. But what I'm saying is, it's to take more than press releases. The actions need to be done. Like I mentioned yesterday, what does the security agencies, the law enforcement need to do and um, one of our guests yesterday suggested that the active steps we need to see, you know, being taken by the government is maybe patrol teams going around, making sure that if you see anybody who's trying to, um, you know, harass anyone, trying to vandalize property of people who are going about their lawful activities, those people should be apprehended. So it basically sets like the tone. It, you know, you get those scapegoats and you punish them according well, to the law. I personally, so I those personally actions believe, need to be done. That's, yeah, but that I personally really what believe that, you know, first of all, I think we, we should admit that the, you know, security agencies, you know, are not capable of policing the whole of the Southeast. You think so? Of, yes. It's pretty obvious, and that's why people would rather stay at home and avoid trouble because they know that there's not enough patrol teams that will be able to actually, you know, ensure that the safety and security of everybody in the south is that's not that's not to save ourselves. I can't speak can't to even... the statistics of how many police people so, or police so officers are, the... we have in the southeast as regarding their capability, but we know that Anita. one thing we've repeatedly talked about is are the politicians and people in power willing Anita, to go ahead Anita, and use it's, what it's they have at It's pretty obvious, and it was obvious, it has been obvious for a very, very long time, and that's why we continue to have security challenges in Nigeria, including the aftermath of the NSAS protest, but because there's enough, there's enough, you would assume that there's enough security agencies. And we mentioned yesterday that there's the NSCDC, there's the DSS, there's the Army, there's the police, there's, or there's all different um, formations in the police, anti-this, anti-that, anti-uncle this, uncle, you know, there's many of these squads, but there's, it's obviously not going to be enough um, 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 to actually maintain law and order. But one thing that I, th will, I feel is at the end of all of this, there would be a breaking point. There would be a point where everything, you know, either implodes or explodes. There's going to be a, a, a particular point. It might be tomorrow where people will get to realize that, okay, you know, we, we actually do not fear the IPOB and whatever it is, and they will come out 
It will get there. It's either going to be caused by hunger, when people realize how much they've suffered every Monday, and they will say, well, IPOB, um, we, we understand your sentiments and whatever it is that you're fighting for, mm -hmm. but don't involve my business with it, because I have to feed my family. I have to eat on Monday. And that's your personal problem if your leader is not um, released yet. That's your personal challenge. I don't, mm -hmm. don't involve me. It's going to get to that point. I want, I'm looking forward. Let's see how tomorrow plays out. I'm very sure that nobody is going to obey the IPOB, because it's a, it's a Thursday, and no one is going to be sitting at home. After sitting at home on Monday, you want me to sit at home again on Thursday, Everybody's going to be out um, tomorrow and they can do absolutely nothing. They will probably, you know, bully a few people in the villages and the outskirts, but that's the most that they can do. No, they're not declaring a sit at home on Thursday, are they? They're daring the president to come to no, the house. No, they actually did declare a sit at not... home. They said people should sit at home. No, yeah. okay. Yeah. All right. So, our next top trending story um, still bothers about security. It seems like security is like the big deal these days. And it's not because of security, it's because of the lack of it. And, um, we know that on Monday, Katsina State Governor Aminu Matari had, you know, spoken on a TV program saying that, you know, all cattle herders are, or all criminal herders are, from, are Fulani indigents. So he basically um, said, quote, majority of those involved in this banditry are Fulanese, whether it is palatable or whether it is not palatable, but that's the truth. Matari said, I am not saying that 100% of them are Fulanese, but majority of them are, and these are people who live in the forest, and their main occupation is cattle rearing. This is what Masari said um, on that TV program on Monday. Um, there's been a response to this, and it's by the Fulani Social Cultural Organization, the Mieti Ala Kota Ohori. They lambasted the Katsina State Government in a um, speech, in an interview they granted Sahara reporters, they said that Katsina State Governor Aminu Masari is a drunkard. They say he is a vote thief and that he's the worst governor that Katsina State has ever had. So they just went on and on to say it's a fallacy for you to say that um, cattle herders are um, Fulani, of Fulani origin. I mean, Masari also said that even the infiltration that we've seen in Nigeria from West African countries and North African countries are also people of the Fulani extraction. You know, he's saying there are people like me, we speak the same language, we pray to the same God, we have the same religious beliefs, and that they are banded. So he's basically putting them one and the same. But the issue is beyond an admittance of the um, ethno-religious backgrounds of these people. It's what's been done about it. But for this Fulani social cultural group, they're just against the governor's um, claims that most of the cattle breeders who are terrorists, who are bandits, are full on the origin. But let's interrogate the truth. Is that a lie or not regarding where these people come from? It's not necessarily a stereotype of, oh, all Fulani people are this. But the issue is the cattle breeders who are terrorists, the cattle breeders who go ahead and commit criminal offenses, where are they from? But I, like I said earlier, it's beyond an admittance of where they're from. It's what's been done about crime, regardless of who commits it, regardless of where they're from. That really is my take. Well, um, um, Governor uh, Minu Masari, um, you know, in re I think he was uh, responding to a question where he was asked, you know, who are, the, who are these people? You know, and of course, also, uh, the question also went further to point out that he had met with them a few times. Uh, which is true, there's pictures of him and, you know, these uh, alleged bandits or terrorist uh, meeting. Um, and he said, oh, they're like you, they're like me, they're, you know, not very different from who I am, they're full and ease and all of that. Which, you know, if you are looking for, because I've, I've repeatedly said this, that we need some level of truth. And if we can't find the truth, uh, we will continue to deceive ourselves with ending the, the, in the insurgency and insecurity challenges. If people aren't also being honest, then we'll continue also to deceive ourselves that we're fighting uh, these um, uh, terrorists and we will never win. Um, so he has spoken his own truth. Uh, the Fulani group that is countering it, did they, they have still not been able to point out who exactly is, you know, um, or who these people are, you know, but they wouldn't say instead. They would rather attack Governor Masari instead of uh, pointing out, you know, their own facts. There is a possibility, and I think over time there's also, it, ha it has also been mentioned, that there's a possibility that there are other criminal elements that have taken advantage of the security situation in the country to also carry out their own, um, you know, uh, motives 
you know, and of course, everybody will be grouped as unknown gunmen or grouped as bandits, you know, or grouped as, uh, you know, kidnappers. They would also commit their own murder and, you know, the you know, media will simply just report it as, you know, unknown gunmen or bandits or terrorists, you know, attacks or so on, so village. Um, there's that possibility. But from what um, Aminu Masari is saying, is, I guess he's speaking from what he has seen and what he you know, knows, to the best of his knowledge, that these people who are committing these atrocities are you know, mostly Fulani. Um, and you know, like you mentioned, who exactly, um, which other tribe, which other set of people are moving around with cattle in country, are cattle headers in the country. There's barely, there's barely any other tribe mm -hmm. that does cattle head in country. They're you know, mostly Fulani. So I'm not sure what the argument is. It's mostly just that group trying to um, save face so you know you don't completely paint their tribe that way mm -hmm. um, and all of that but um, I don't think it's um, the I, I think it's an important question an important angle with your fight against um, insecurity and it's important that people get to know who they are but it doesn't necessarily mean stereotyping the whole of the Fulanese as cattle headers or murderers or you know terrorists there's very many of them who have simply just done their business um, unfortunately, their, tra their trade and their head, head in business has been taken advantage of by criminals to commit these atrocities. There's also the part where, um, you know, people have said that this is really just land grabbing, you know, and trying to wipe up co out communities and take over their land and some of all of that. There's many angles. Um, we must search for truth and we must be honest with ourselves. And if Masare has been honest, then that's his truth. Um, if the other people, the other group don't agree with him, then can they share with us? But like I said, who um, they think it is? Beyond whoever is committing it, what's been done to checkmate crime? Hmm. Our next top trending story is about uh, double speak, um, the seeming hypocrisy of our social media influencers. So we're seeming like, like politicians, like influencers, where you hear them say one thing, and it seems like just a short time later. We're hearing a totally different perspective, a totally different angle. It seems like, you know, but let's, let's bring you the fact so you understand exactly what I'm saying. So Jeff Phillips one um, put up out a, a tweet on, on Twitter, and he says, this picture is of an electronic voting machine from Kajuna. It's coming on your screen in a few seconds. This picture is of an electronic voting machine from Kajuna local government's election, courtesy of the best He's describing the governor as the best and most reformative governor Nigeria has ever had since independence. Malam Nasil Erufai. He went on to say, retreats to all the timelines of all frustrated children of multiple anger. Those were his words. He put a picture of this, you know, um, voting machine. And only for us to see a while later that he's saying, hmm, what is sure that Electronic voting is susceptible to manipulation and electoral malpractices, and that the Western world is already having a rethink and going back to ballot paper. So you can see um, where exactly does he stand um, regarding commending Governor Erufai for you know the electronic voting machines in Kaduna state elections with the picture there, and then going ahead to say in another breath or even in the same breath that. Electronic voting is susceptible to manipulation and electoral fraud. We have another proof here for you, and it's by um, Mr. Odans. He's also quite popular on the timeline on social media. This um, quote by Mr. Odans is in reaction to um, a picture of Aisha Yusufu. That's coming up on your screen soon. Um, in that picture, that picture went viral during the NSAS protest where Aisha Yusufu um, she, she's very vocal regarding social political issues where, you know, her hands were raised up to the air, her hijab was flowing, there was a crowd of protesters behind her and took that picture and it became like an embodiment of the, you know, the Nigerian spirit saying no to oppression. That picture really went viral and I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. So in reaction to this, um, in 2020, this Mr. Odan said, Madam Aisha Yusufu is a brave woman. While everyone was running, this woman was walking casually in front of the police with her fist held high in defiance. Wish my phone wasn't dead would have been a perfect shot. We need more people like her. Hashtag NSAS. Now guess what? Just yesterday, this same Mr. Odans put out counter statements on Twitter. And he said, 
When we got to the police headquarters, she, and by she here, was referring to Aisha Yusufu. She was lying down by the side, pressing her phone. It was the great oracle, another popular voice and face, who was negotiating with the police, addressing them and all. If you ask me how Aisha managed to position herself for this photo, that's the same photo he praised, Wallahi, I can't tell, like it was quite a surprise. Like next day, that photo splashed everywhere. I am not sure she returned for subsequent protests too. I am not sure. She, was, she just grabbed headlined with that photo and that was it. And great oracle, he was sidelined and totally forgotten. Barely anyone remembers he protested. So my question is, when he put out that statement, first of all, saying while well, everyone was running, Aisha Yusufu was casually walking in front of the police. Did he not see that? Or did he hear? Was that hearsay that he tweeted? Because that tweet sounded confident that he saw with his eyes that while everyone was running, Madame Yusufu was casually walking in front of the police. Did he see that on video? Did he see that with his own eyes? Well, also, well. when he went ahead to counter himself or himself yesterday, what changed? So it's the double speak we're talking about here and the hypocrisy of politicians and influencers. Well, um, I think it's important to know. Uh, there's not much to say about this. There, uh, it's important to know that um, um, you know, a lot of these persons that um, you know, are called, in quote, influencers, um, you know, put out tweets um, for two reasons. First of all, their own personal thoughts, and then second is what they have been paid to say. Um, or um, and or really depending on what you know narrative they are trying to spread, and that's why they're called called influencers uh, because they can influence a narrative, they can influence a perspective on, di on different things. Uh, Jeff Phillips has been known to be um, you know uh, you know a person who tweets in favor of you know the APC, I guess, um, and in favor of government for a very long time. You know that's that's really the, the position that he has taken for a long time, and. It really also depends on what the government or what the person, um, you know, in, in quote, and well, what the person he is tweeting in favor of um, feels like expressing at that point. And so that's really what to expect from them. If tomorrow, um, these are people that, you know, you can stand under the rain with and say, oh, you know, it's raining so heavily. And they can tell you, no, it's not raining. You know, somebody just put water from the ceiling um, because they need to favor whoever it is that they are take, taking stance with, you know, at that time. It's, it's, it's stereotype Nigerian influencer uh, behavior. Um, and so, that, you know, everything that you read at every time, you know, take it with a pinch of salt. You know, Odans really um, could have seen whatever he saw back then, but decided that at that time it wasn't necessary to express that. And so he would rather put out this statement to create this narrative. And then a year later thinks, okay, it's now time to speak the truth and share what exactly happened on that day. Or it could be vice versa. It really depends on what... Um, you know, narrative they're trying to put out at that time. And so they can change, you know, their perspectives left and right. So I, I, you Take know, everything you see on Nigeria and Twitter. With exactly. Things. Just, just um, moving on with that thought, um, we need to develop critical thinking. Question everything you see. That's, this is something I constantly educate my parents about because it seems like people who are older almost take everything they see online literally. You know, you send them DMs about, you know, um, contribute money to this and it seems like, oh, they want to do that. So, we, the younger generation, have that responsibility now to educate other people, you know, to develop critical thinking, question everything you see. When someone puts something on Twitter, it doesn't mean it's fact. Even though they put, oh, according to the WHO, that could be made up. You have a responsibility to still go on and say, oh, did the WHO really put out a statement to verify, fact check before you share and before you, you know, take things in hook, line and sinker. And that's it on Top Trending this morning. Let's take a break here and return to analyze the papers on Off the Press.